uh, you can kind of relax your uh, mathematical brain a little bit um, because the discussion will largely be uh, you know systems and and you know understanding of of how things work the the, the Hadoop file system uh, that that sort of thing um, will uh, at the end of the probably in the last hour after the break um, we'll go through a our, we have a 45 node Hadoop file system and we'll we'll put some files on it and look at the replication and see where the blocks are stored and and stuff like that um, and but to start with there's a, a shorter presentation on just you know why do we all why do we need all of this so where did it all come from why did we people go and build Hadoop in the first place and kind of the answer is kind of somewhat clear to you that and this is always this is a very common story that this that, that the amount of data that's that's being generated is just increased dramatically um, over over the last 10 years or more. And uh, people put numbers up like this all the time, uh, you know, 400 terabytes or you know, 500 terabytes and 10 billion photos and 5 petabytes and, you know, the huge amounts of data. It's hard to say, you know, are these numbers correct? Are they accurate? Are these, you know, there's reported stuff from here or there or whatever. Um, but they're all very big. Um, and that, 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 that really is a, um, a huge amount of data and it's what's driving the cost of the storage devices down and the speed of the storage devices to get higher. It's no wonder that you know, solid state drives are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and faster and there's a lot more, as we said, in the memory hierarchy, a lot more opportunity to, to, get, to get a lot of um, speed out of the storage system. So, uh, so there's a lot of uh, data being generated. It's coming from a lot of sources. Um, you know, uh, social network data is, is what I look a lot at. We, we track and, and we process millions of tweets a day. And that's not a lot of tweets really compared to what is produced, but that's the sort of data that we tend to process. Um, and and, and st I mean, then we process it and we actually produce even more results. So as well, when you process this data, this, this is very raw data. This is data, sometimes we call it user-generated data. It's just data that comes from users. A photo or somebody has typed some text. It's, it's not, um, it hasn't been moderated. There's no filtering or anything like that. It's user-generated data. It could be anything. Um, and, and that's raw data. But when you process that, then you start generating even more data. So you generate graphs or, you know, uh, um, updates and things that, 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 that even adds more to the amount of data that we'd like to store or view or process further in the whole pipeline of things that we do. Uh, so it comes from different sources. Yudaya commented about, you know, there's 500 million mobile phones in, in India or something like that. Was that the number? Uh, there's this other chart that we found, um, you know, the, the, the number of connected devices per person. And I know I have a, a laptop, I have a a mobile phone, there it is. I have a tablet as well that I keep in my room there. That's three connected devices that I carry around. So I'm sort of sitting in here somewhere. Um, but, you know, the, this was in 2015. So, you know, the, the, the estimate is connected devices is 50 billion devices in 2020. All of these devices are sensing things as well. So the number of, uh, the, the ability for devices to sense has gone up dramatically as well. Uh, you know, put, put sensors on everything and all of those sensors come back and, and you know, we have to, we ha you know, provide data, right, um, that we can process. Um, so, so, you know, Facebook, it's, it's getting a lot of data, but it's generating a lot of data and, and Twitter generates a lot of data and IBM says this number, it's quite fascinating, you know, 90% of the data generated in just the last two years of all the stored data, so that you know that that I mean, these numbers are just kind of the, the kind of wow numbers that are typically put there. But you know that that it it it's uh, you know kind of fascinating to see, and maybe somehow you know even like to investigate further and see really what they are. And here are a lot of different you know applications of you start analysing the data. So I kind of 
work in this space of security, I guess, with the Department of Defence. We sort of work there, but there's lots of other places. We are trying to push out into other places. You know, traffic control is one that some of the people in, in our, um, the building of our, of our department, is the same, same you know, floor as me, work on. So, you know, all these cars generating GPS coordinates and, and all of that data and analysing all of that somehow trading analytics and you know search quality and they're, they're, you know the, the sales is a big one recommendation systems generating um, you know if you've bought this book then maybe you're interested in this book because there's a whole range of people that have bought that book as well and you know they, they seem to buy the same things as you and you know healthcare as well is a really big area of it generates a lot of data and obviously very important you know in a lot of these places you're saving lives somehow by processing the data and, and, and that's sort of sort of what it's leading to or making a lot of money if you're if you're looking at forecasting you know um, stocks and shares and stuff like that and we started looking at some of that trading analytics ourselves as well um, so what is characterized uh, uh, sometimes, you know, this V3 is very common actually, that there's this, you, first there's volume, then there's velocity, and then there's variety. These are the three things you consider when you think about um, big data. So, so the volume is, which we've already just talked about, but these are some sort of more um, numbers, you know, creating this quintillion bytes of data, 90% of the data, right? So, you know, and again, these numbers, Boeing, so a, a single flight of a 737, um, you know, across the US is 240 terabytes of data. Now, I imagine that data is very low entropy data. I could imagine it could be compressed quite a lot, I, I suppose. It doesn't say compressed data there. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a lot of data for a single flight. You know, how many different flights are there at any one time? And, and things, anomalies that could be going wrong with flights. You know, can you use this data to detect if there was some, something that needs to be repaired in the aircraft later and stuff like that. So you get all the data later, you're processing it, trying to, trying to figure out if there's something you can learn. Because, I mean, why we even process the data as well is it's just insight. We're learning things, you know, there's so much to be found is what people, it's like a, they're calling this data as somehow the, the uh, new oil. You know, it's 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 what where where all of the new money is to be found is somehow processing all of the data, getting insights from. It. So, and we sort of said this as well with smartphones and sensors. So, so you know, the story is that there's a lot of data, but as well, it comes very fast too. So, millions of events per second on click streams. So, you know, every time you click somewhere on a web page, the click is being registered and it's being you know processed and streamed somehow and you know, a lot of things can happen in real time but but the data is is uh, is is coming is coming very very fast so stock trading algorithms are very high frequency within microseconds people like to be able to compute something and, and then change and make decisions and machines that, that are communicating in factories or whatever they, you know, they're just generating a lot of data in real time and very quickly so, so, you know, people playing games is a big area as well that I did do some research in, in large scale games and, and you know, um, being able to support large numbers of people interacting in the virtual world in some way and so on. And there's a lot, so there's a lot of information that comes from these kinds of things. And so there's, there's a, not only is there a lot of data, but it's obviously, it's coming very quickly um, and, um, and, and then it, it's actually, there's a lot of variety. It's not just numbers and dates and strings, but it's, you know, it's geospatial data, GPS coordinates, you know, you know some sort of and 3D data and audio and video and unstructured text. And, you know, it's a whole heap of things that come, you know, different sorts of sensors, as we said. Um, so, so that makes it a bit harder, you know, typically you'd, you, you, you might, start putting things in a relational database like MySQL, you have tables and so on, but to try to take a lot of this unstructured stuff and put it into a form where you can process it in such a traditional database is kind of hard. So, so people kind of start looking at different ways of storing the data as well, which we'll talk a little bit more about so you can m more easily work with this kind of unstructured, unstructured um, data. Um, so, so you, you need to be able to, to process, um, process the data, um, which 
you know, it kind of means you, you have to map it to some sort of framework. You need to have some way of processing and connecting the extra data from the storage. And so, you know, the data is being produced in, in, in places and, and so, you know, so for Twitter, you know, it's an aggregator of data. It's got its own sort of internal servers and that. And then it can, it can stream data out um, to people um, and it, it kind of... Uh, um, gives a certain ability for us to access it, but but it it's it's somewhat limited as well in the way that you you can access and, and filter and, and get the cert, certain kinds of data, um, and so um, part of of understanding this integrating disparate data stores because you know we don't just want to look at Twitter, but we want to look at at blogs and other sources of data and somehow be able to process all of these things and uh, 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 make conclusions based on correlating things from different data sources um, is that you know we need a way of storing it all uh, in a way that we can we can either you know map tasks out to it or, or, or get to it quickly and and this, you know, Hadoop and, and MapReduce and so on is, is a, a, a kind of along the pathway of, of being able to uh, uh, aggregate the data and understand that, uh, you know, that you don't necessarily, when you're processing, want to bring the data to all one place to process but be able to send out what you need to process to where the data is because moving the data around can be actually quite expensive. It used to be maybe like 15 or 20 years ago we talked about grid computing a lot and people talked about um, data grids, you know, and, and, and it was a lot about moving data around actually and uh, we've kind of gone away from that because moving data can be very expensive. Uh, we we uh, for some time, we were taking tweets from Twitter from the US and just download. You know, we're getting we're getting this data uh, to the University of Melbourne, and there was a I can't remember a few terabytes of tweets that we that we had, and each tweet is about two kilobytes to four kilobytes of data. We had several terabytes, but it cost the University of Melbourne about fifty thousand dollars in download costs to, to to transfer the data, which. It was a bit of a surprise, but you know, there's this cost involved, like real money cost in terms of transferring data around. So, you know, it would be better for us to kind of have the data stream to somewhere in Amazon in the US and process it there, you know, rather than having to, to bring it and process it in Australia and then only stream results back, which presumably could be, you know, a bit more refined and less, you know, less cost and so on and so forth. So understanding where the data is, where it's coming from, and, and, and using distributed systems in such a way that you can, you, know, you can run and store data in places that minimize cost and transfer and so on, is, you know, is, a, is an optimization problem in itself, right? Um, and because these large uh, suppliers of, of cloud systems and so on, they, they have, when you look at their, the way that they <laughs> cost their resources, it's quite detailed. You know, it's just, Lots of tables of things on, on, on uh, um, each and little, you know, the CPU, the memory, the storage, everything is the, the bandwidth and so on, and where the machine is located, and which part of the world and so on. All of these things are quite um, um, sophisticated, you know, um, 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 put down. So there's a lot of thinking there, and then and then you know the, actually processing the data and executing some some jobs and 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 getting getting results. So, um, and then the you know there's the structure of the data itself. So we kind of said so there's structured data which is very traditional data that's kind of what you might get. So uh, in an organisation that has databases that it's been around for a while. So. A very large organization with tables, so maybe a university that has a lot of structured data around courses and students and their, you know, their grades and all of that sort of thing is typically kept. It's very structured. Um, and, and that might be a source of big data as well, where you, where you have something that then pulls all of that out and, and converts it into a, a, a form that it can be processed using MapReduce or something like that. So, so that, that's actually a business model that people are using these days where they will come to your business and they will just suck up all of the data that you have everywhere, you know, in all of your databases and everything, convert it into one form that's just a, 
you know, like a MapReduce type thing perhaps, and then process it and provide back reports, you know, that, that is about all of the things that you have. So it's kind of in some way providing another layer of, 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 of uh, data processing. And there's a semi-structured stuff. But so the, the x-axis on this diagram, perhaps you can't exactly read all the way, but is the, 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 the structured, so structured, semi-structured, unstructured. And then there's this data velocity from real time to batch processing. And I, I, I don't know, I think some of these things I would, I would move upwards. So the social media you know, analysis, sediment analysis, we do a lot of as well, but we're trying to do in real time. I think, uh, you know, it's nicer if you can do things in real time, but some things are just very impossible to do in real time. So video surveillance and analysis, the amount of computing power, you have a large city that's got cameras everywhere and you're trying to correlate maybe something that's going on. So one of the projects we, that we were thinking of doing recently was looking at video surveillance of crowds that are building around a public event and looking at Twitter data and saying, well, you know, can we, uh, can we detect if somebody just tweeted, who was it in the crowd? You know, so for correlating the video with the Twitter data and trying, you know, so, um, so but, the, but the video analysis is quite hard, so it's, so it's typically done in batch, but I, I think things are kind of moving upward, but, you know, stuff like risk analysis and, and, and fraud detection is stuff that you need to do now, you can't leave it for a week or a month or something like that, right, to, to in order to produce some sort of, uh, of outcome you know, and, and stuff like that, right? So, um, so this is one way to look at the structure of, of the data. Um, you have to store it, um, and, and that really means kind of selecting what you want to store. And typically, you won't be able to store everything. You, you know, this is just too much. It will depend a bit on, on how much resources you have, but you'll, you'll end up sort of selecting what exactly you need and eliminating the redundant data that you don't need. We've, we've ended up having to do that. We did try to store everything that we were collecting, event, but you know, we just sort of quickly ran out of resources and you have to sort of make decisions on what exactly is needed and what is not needed. And, um, and we, we started trying to store stuff in MySQL. We were getting a a stream of, but the, my, the problem with these databases is that they have locking and they're very strict in the way that they work and, and that really just makes them very, very slow in terms of, of, of constantly updating the tables and getting s streams of data that are going in. And so we did end up moving towards different ways of storing the data, the so-called NoSQL. It, it, it's really just a key value type storage system that's immu immutable as well, typically in some of them. Once you store the data, it doesn't really change. So, so you might have key value type you know, approach, which is what MapReduce is, you know, is, is going to do. You need to break up your data and figure out how you get, what will be the keys, how will it map and, and reduce. So we'll talk a bit about that in the later lectures tomorrow or the day after or something like that. Or um, well, you might have graphs, and the graphs can, can, are interesting. There's a kind of research area there is large graph processing. I have a PhD student that's working in that space. So once you get a graph that's bigger than can fit in the memory of a single computer, you know, single node, then you have to distribute the graph you know, because it just can't fit anymore. Um, but then you have the problem if you've got a distributed graph that you have to run your, you know, if you're trying to do page rank or, you know, a, you know maybe centrality or other kinds, you know, clustering of the graph. How do those graph algorithms run? You know, so you have a parallel algorithm of some kind, right, that's running. But then again, you've got always more data coming and the graph is changing and so on. So I'm kind of talking more in a real-time sense than in a batch processing sense. So in a batch processing, which is more your Hadoop style, um, then, you know, you have sort of static data. You process it may be a very big graph that you map out, process and come back and so on. Um, and that would be the way that you do. But as you will see with Hadoop, it is moving towards and, and you know, it's trying to support streaming as well. And, and we have some um, lectures later as well on, on, on um, you know, uh, uh, Spark um, 
Apache Beam, which is the latest thing from Google. In terms of streaming, and Hadoop tries to do streaming, the principle there is because it, it came from batch processing, so here's a batch of data, the data's not changing, process it, get a result, then maybe move on to the next batch. So if you make the batch smaller, you know, then you can, it's kind of like streaming, you have your micro batches is what it tends, it's what the way that it went. So you have smaller and smaller batches so that you can process the new data as it arrives. Um, which is kind of the way that Hadoop has gone. So, um, but so you have that, I mean, it's very interesting stuff with processing graphs and documents. So we have the Hadoop file system. Obviously, we're going to be, you know, this slide set is, is kind of talking a bit about Hadoop because that's what, the way that we're going. But there are other things that you could use. But Hadoop also has HBase. It's a database for, for you know, that, that works on top of the Hadoop file system. So um, that, that, that's more the traditional database, right, with big tables and stuff like that, so you can use the kind of relations. And it has Hive, which is a data warehousing project that, that you know, that can, um, you know, summarizing of data. So the data warehouse is a concept where you just have a large amount of data that you're processing over and getting some insight from um, you know, summaries and analysis of the data. So there's a lot of things there. Um, so the, you know, the, the biggest challenge is just the time it takes to get the data off the disk. That, that, that is the, the bottleneck of these systems. That you, you, know, you get a lot of data, it's streaming in, and you put it on the disk and you think, well, we'll process it later. You know, we'll just get the data and put it on, on store it, and then we'll process it. The problem is it takes forever to get it back off the disk, right? That is the bottleneck. Um, and, and I guess this is where the stream processing kind of mentality came a bit later as well is that, you know, okay, we can put it on the disk and process it later, but we'll never really get around to it because there's so much data that's coming and, and, and so on. Let's just process it as it comes and then maybe we can forget about, you know, we, we, you know this kind of thing and we'll just kind of keep in memory and stuff like that what we're doing. Um, but, you know, so sometimes you just don't want to throw away. You, you do want to obviously process later. And, and, but that becomes the bottleneck, right? And you've got to get the data back off the disk. And, and so the disk speed was a real problem. And, and, and that's really what's been driving these things. We talked about these things in the, perhaps the first day we were here, you know, these, the different SATA drives and SSD. And, you know, so, you know, the, the seat time is a bit of a problem, even just that itself, right? So, um, so this is kind of the challenge of, of just getting, getting the data as well, unreliable machines. So we talked a bit about, you know, the, thing, the fact that things fail. So one machine, you know, if you look, one, one t fails one time in three years. So, or, or, you know, so a three years mean time between failure, right? If you have a thousand machines, then, you know, maybe you've got a machine failing every day kind of thing. So, so, you know, the, the thousand machines is not really a large number of machines. So, so you know, the, 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 you know the, the, the bigger the system, the more likely that any one time something is going to fail. The probability of failure just goes up with the number of components um, in, in the system. So, so these are the challenges. Um, and it's expensive. So, you know, like, you know, you, you, you have to, we have to be able to, to, to scale up without it costing us a lot of money. We don't want to have to build uh, you know, sp you know, specialized I.O. devices just in order to solve this problem. Right? Um, so, so when things fail, uh, you, know, you, you, you have to, if, if you have that kind of failing constantly, you need to be able to do it gracefully. You, you can't sort of say, well, it failed, so we need to now, you know, restart the entire system and reload all the data from a backup or so, you know, like this kind of thing we can't really do. We sort of need to make sure that it's graceful and a little bit of, you know, the failure part, I guess, is where the coding theory will help a lot. You know, as a data node fails, we can reconstruct data and so on and so forth, right? Um, but as well, you have to be able to do that with, with the processing. So if you're running a job over a, 
uh, you know, the data is you're not just storing it, but processing it. And there's some operations going on. It would be nice to be able to recover and so on from, from the processing. I was sitting with some guys at Google in Sydney and they were saying, you know, the problem that they have with these map reduced tasks can be that, you know, it be creates a very big tree of processing that happens. And, you know, if something goes wrong in the tree, quite they have to start again, you know, like there's this, it's not easy to be able to just recover from that one thing that went wrong in the processing and be able to do again. So, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting work there in making these systems, you know, be reliable in all the aspects. <laughs> um, so the question of backup and the cost performance and, and security is, you know, as well. So uh, you, you've got the data spread across multiple clouds. Um, you know, presumably these nodes you can access to read the data from, that makes them open, you know, uh, uh, to, to other, uh, other people potentially that could break in, but as well the cloud providers themselves, you might not want them to know the kind of data that you have, that right, you're stored on the system. So you have a question of, of how, how can you make the data secure, I think Udaya and I are talking about secure data, you know, can it be encrypted and still be and be processed at the same time? You know, how, and there are ways. I, you know, I think I understand a little bit. Uh, you know, that you, you can have algorithms that can process on encrypted data to get results that are still encrypted, so that you know, not even when the processing is taking place does the result need or the data need to be revealed in the in the memory of, or at the processor, right? It, it somehow. Um, and so, so that even the cloud provider can't really see what, what it is that you're doing. So, and then you've got to be able to process everything in parallel, right? So there's this sort of stuff. And that's really what uh, uh, Hadoop, you know, that's, that's where pe you know, people started building these systems. So it's, you know, it's, it's about, it's about um, being able to uh, very easily store large amounts of data effectively um, and you know, scalably and ch in, in very cheap way. So just take commodity stuff that you have, you could run it on your laptop, you could connect a few laptops together if you wanted to over a network and have them run different data nodes of a Hadoop system and it would store the data across those nodes and, and do what it does, right? It's quite flexible, easy to use in that way. Um, and, and, you know, obviously process as well and, and so there's a sort of a notion of building a data, you know, data economy. I, I, you know, I know Google just has so much data. I was talking to some other people there at Google. They have so much data, and they have, that comes in from even just their their search search words, you know. And then they, what they have is it all goes into a central store, and then they have teams of people that are building um, different ways of learning something from those search terms, right, that, that are pr all processing all that data um, and in all different ways to try to gather different kinds of insight um, from that. So, and, and as I said, you know, Hadoop's getting more real time, so, you know, it was originally just, you know, batch processing, you've got a lot of data to store, you need to process it, but the data obviously changes, you get more data come along and, and, and so on, and, and so you have to update that and, and uh, that's a bit of a problem from a batch processing point of view normally. You, you wouldn't think like that, but, um, and that's where micro batching came along. So it's getting real time, it's very cost effective, there's a lot of technologies using it and it's getting cloudy, I think the, the uh, you know, I mean, Hadoop originally it was a lot of these things were developed, you know, in-house. You run on 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 racks of 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 nodes that that you you control completely all yourself. You don't run on the cloud, but um, it's moving. You know, you can you can. It's it's much more flexible. So, um, you know, it's over these years. It's kind of. 20 to 30 percent of, what does this say? Matching job postings. So it's it's a fairly popular technology from a an industry point of view. People are really looking for, uh, 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 you know, people with these skills. There was another chart. I don't know where it went. I, I wanted to have that chart, but it's, um, I think the 
person helping me prepare the deleted it, but it was showing the growth from the beginning, so from 2006 or something, and, and increasing up. It seems to have kind of plateaued maybe over the last couple of years, maybe dropped off a little bit there, but I don't think it's going to disappear at all. And um, it, it is an effective system for processing large amounts of data that you have. Um, so it's a framework that allows for this distributed processing across commodity computers, right? And it's a very simple programming model. It's designed to scale up and, you know, to handle thousands of machines. And we'll see a lot about the design and how that works and so on as we go through. It's open source. It's an implementation of Google's MapReduce, the Google um, file system, is that, or distributed file system. So Google made something, and now this is kind of an open source implementation of it. Created by this guy, Doug Cutting. I, don't know him personally, but he created Apache Lucene, which perhaps you've used, which is a, a text search library. It's a very effective um, text indexing system so that you can, um, for querying text databases and so on. So, um, so, so it's an open source. It's got an Apache license. You can, you can get access to it, download it, and so on. So the axioms by which they, you know, when you build these things, you have in mind the, the, what you're trying to achieve, the things that should always be true as you're building the system. And, and so the design axioms are store and process large amounts of data, obviously, that's, you know, it's got to be able to do that. Performance of storage and processing should scale linearly. You add another computer, it just gives you, you know, the, so now what this is saying, scale linearly, is that the overheads are, are very minimal. Or at, if you wanted to, in complexity terms, the overhead should be like, you know, log the number of nodes. The, the, if n is the number of nodes, then the overhead shouldn't really be more than a logarithm. And if it was more than that, then it wouldn't really, it'd be probably the overheads would grow too much, right? So you need to keep the overheads low, which is actually kind of hard. I, I always find these claims of scaling linearly a little bit like, no, oh, well, you know, because I, I always look at extreme systems. So if n is the number of nodes, I like to, I like to say, how does the system behave as n goes to infinity? What is the properties of the system? Does it collapse? Where does it, what happens as the size of, it, you can't make a system that big, but as you start getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, how does the system behave? And you find out that as systems get bigger, what you'll find is that the communication becomes the bottleneck. It, you know, if, you know, if you have a system with an infinite number of nodes, one thing is that they, it cannot fit in a finite amount of space. You can't have an infinite number of machines in a finite amount of space. It must take up an infinite amount of space. And therefore, the distance between the machines becomes infinite. And the, so the, the, the communication time becomes infinite. So the communication will always be uh, the limiting factor in the, in, the, in the size of the machine, right? It'll, that will always be something that, that really will be the bottleneck. But if you've got a really, really good network, then you know, this should, should not be too bad. You could, you could get, you know, and, and then, you know, building high performance networks was part of my PhD thesis. So high performance interconnection networks and that for high performance computing was something that I got um, very interested in. So the computation should move to the data is very important. You don't want to have to be transferring data to do the computation. You'd like to be able to put the data out in a way in which when you actually do the computation, it's all very nicely placed. You just send out to the nodes what needs to be computed and the node just reads, you know, that each job just reads locally. That would be best, you know, from the machine uh, and processes and then you start aggregating back, you reduce it back, you know, the results. So that would be what you would want to do. What you don't want is a situation where you're having to where a node is having to transfer data from other nodes in order to do its computation, because the transfer, as we said, the network is, a, you know, becomes the bottleneck. The transfer has to go over the network, and the network will always be the problem in this in this kind of thing. So, so, uh, so you, you want it also to be simple. It, 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 you know, the the and when we say simple to code and extensible, this is a question of the API. So from a programming point of view, you know, from a, or from a software point of view, what does the API look like? And, and, and can you express complicated uh, uh, you know, calculations in a simple way? 
using the API, right? So, so that should be the case. And, and, and the failure is just assumed. Every part of the system, every time you, you, know, you look into different, the way that it's been designed, you assume that things will break down. And so what happens in the case of a node break, in, in every step of the, uh, along the way of doing things? And we'll look a bit of, of, about that in the later slides. So this kind of manageable and self-healing that, that, you know, if things go wrong and a node restarts, uh, you know, the administrator should not have to do very much, should just start the node and it, you know, the system can figure out what went wrong and how it can recover. You know, networking is, um, stuff is very much like that. You, you tend to just plug a router in and it talks to other routers and it just figures out how the paths should change. So, so this is kind of self-healing stuff or ma management. So, and it's all on commodity hardware. It shouldn't have to be specialized stuff, right? So these are the axioms that um, were in mind when <coughs> developing the system. Um, so from a, so that's, you know, from a, so the map reduce part is the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the processing part, you, you, know, you need to split up the data somehow, um, process the data in parallel, sort and combine. We'll talk a bit more about this actually, not, this, not today, but in the future uh, lectures when we do some MapReduce programming. We'll show some MapReduce programming, um, run some examples and, and, and try to, you know, you, you might be interested to, to see how all that works. So there's stuff about that. So the history, perhaps this slide should be first. So 2002, you know, they, they started. So I don't know what Natch is, and then Google published some stuff, and then, and then they worked on D and at DFS MapReduce support in this, and then Yahoo went and hired these guys, and they they built Hadoop, and then, you know, uh, they, they, you know, the New York Times convert four terabytes of archive, and and, and then they, you know, there was some interesting results where they could sort a lot of data in a very small amount of time using so many nodes and so it kind of you know grew. A, a 2002 was when I completed my PhD. I started as a lecturer. So over that time that I've been you know doing research all of this stuff has been happening uh, you know at the same time. So um, so you know you could you can compare Hadoop versus the relational you know database uh, management systems and you know so so maybe as it said an elephant can't jump but it can carry a heavy load I I don't know where the saying comes from but it's kind of saying that well you might not be able to do you know all of the joins and the and the various things that you would do in the database systems but. Um, you can work on a lot of data and you can work on less structured data and, and, and do a lot, uh, you, you know, the, the, it's the size of the data that's important here. That's, you know, obviously the driving, you know, part, the, act, the first axiom of the building the system is it can handle a lot of data. Um, and the relation, if you've, if you've tried scaling these databases, you know, like SQL and so on, it's very hard actually, you, you end up with people that are just, you hire specifically to do the database administrators, right? They're just there to work with the database and optimize it and, and get it working properly and scaling it up. Um, so that can be, traditionally can be very costly for an organization to maintain very big databases. And so Hadoop again has gone and, and said, well, it doesn't need to be that costly to store a lot of data. You just put a lot of nodes and and store the data and process the data, you know, you can, you can do in other ways. Um, if you throw away some of the stuff maybe that, that probably you don't do a lot of anyway, you maybe you don't end up doing a lot of joins or if you think about what you're processing in a different kind of way, then you can get away with what we're doing, right? So, so you can still do complicated things, it just means thinking about how you're going to process the data in a different way, a different mentality to what has been done before. Um, and again, as well, you know, making some assumptions like data is immutable. So once it's put there, it doesn't change anymore, right? So you can kind of keep adding to it, but you're not really deleting from it. And that, again, sort of simplifies things so that you don't have inconsistencies in, in, in you know, in, where we might have multiple writes and reads to a database or something like that. So it can be very effective. Cost per terabyte, $250 per terabyte, uh, whereas other solutions, $100,000 to $100,000 per Per terabyte, you know, if you, you know, so so, 
you know. I mean, it's using the 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 um, the mentality of that, that's been around since the 90s, which is the cluster mentality, right? Clusters, we used to call them networks of workstations, right? A long time ago, when I was at university, I was sort of calling networks of workstations a cluster mentality, which you can instead of getting a supercomputer, you can just get a cluster, and you get the same, if not better, computing power in some sense, but uh, you you uh, is a lot cheaper. But the one thing the cluster perhaps is not good at is if you want to have, if you need a problem that has to fit in memory, it, it, a lot of memory on the one, then you have to distribute. And then so some problems the cluster won't do, but for the you know, vast majority of problems, the cluster mentality was much cheaper and could solve than the supercomputer mentality. And that's, I think, why a number of supercomputing companies went bankrupt around that time, right? Because the, the, the market wasn't there anymore. People moved on to clusters that, you know, you just take uh, the cheap computers and put them together. Hadoop is all following all of that kind of thing, but in the database space, right? It's doing the same thing and saying, well, we don't need these complicated databases. I don't think, sorry, I don't think it's saying we don't need them, but, you know, we can do certain things without them. It's a lot cheaper. And those certain things are what we're interested in. So it's not really replacing them, you know, but it's saying, you know, you know, the, these enterprise data warehouses and massively parallel processing systems, stuff like that. But it's a kind of a complement, right? So, and a lot of things we can do, we don't need that. We can do using a simpler way, a cheaper way. So that's kind of reasoning. Um, and, you know, the trend, so, you know, understanding the trend, why people are doing what they're doing and where is it going into the future. If you're thinking about building systems to solve problems, but you have to understand what is the what is the problem now? You know what is the real issue that that needs to be addressed by changing the the way that we do things, and then coming up with a system that can address that, and that potentially then starts to get some traction with other people, other users, right? Um, so, but it can be a bit hard in in academia. Because we don't typically have access to such big big data systems, you know, in the academic space, we, we tend to have really smaller systems. So it can be hard to see the challenges. You have to work with industry and see the problems that they have and try to get as much from them as, as you can. What are they doing and why are they doing it, you know, and, and try to understand. Because that's where the problems, the real problems, tend to get generated, right? Um, so that, that can help a lot. So Hadoop is the file system plus MapReduce. Um, you know, it's this we will talk about today. This we will talk about later. Um, it has, it's a master-slave architecture for both the storage and the processing, right? So there's one kind of node, um, typically. So that you know, there's there's something Udaya kind of. There's a couple of slides I think earlier, but. You know, we'll say, you know, there's, a, there's a, what's called a name node, and then there's a bunch of data nodes, and the name node is really, you know, controlling the data nodes um, in some sense. There's a secondary name node that's, that's doing some sort of snapshot. It's not really for backup. There's another thing for backup that we'll say. Um, it, does a, it does a periodic checkpoint is what this, this thing does. Um, so we'll talk a lot more about the details of this. Um, from a, a map reduce point of view, it's very similar. There's a job tracker that you submit work to, so jobs, and then there's a bunch of task trackers that actually, you know, on each each of the data nodes now has a, a process running that, that 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 you map out to the job, and then and then they runs and then get things get reduced. So we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, so the the you know the so-called eco core Hadoop ecosystem is that you've got um, You've got your, your Hadoop system, you know, a job tracker, a name node, a secondary name node. You've got the data nodes and task trackers down here, the so-called slaves, these are the masters, these are the slaves. And then the client here, you know, uh, clients can connect and they can, they can store data, um, you know, or, or submit jobs and get results back, right? So, so you kind of be like this. So maybe, you know, only these nodes um, are visible to the client and all of these nodes are sort of hidden. They don't see necessarily all of that. There's a lot of stuff that's been developed um, <coughs> over the years. Uh, so from the core Hadoop in 2006, HDFS and MapReduce, 
And then um, Zookeeper came along, and Zookeeper and HBase. Zookeeper is a resource management system on clusters that helps re manage resources and some reliability and so on. HBase, we said, is the database things for Hadoop. And so the red is what's already come along, and the black are the extra things. So it's kind of showing a, an increase in different uh, technologies. Spark is up here in 2012. We use Kafka a bit um, in what we do as a messaging system and, and some Spark stuff we do. And there's a lot of things that have grown out of this. Uh, this is a you know, wider ecosystem of, uh, of tools and so on that are, that, are, that are growing. This is just another way of looking that there are different distributions. So we'll be using the Apache distribution, but there are, you know, you could get an Intel distribution. Maybe you have to pay money for it. I don't know. Um, it might be higher performance or something like that, but there are different um, distributions. There are all these related projects, you know, that we sort of had on the last slide we talked a bit about. There are related technologies, so Twitter Storm and, and Apache Storm is something that I use. It's stream processing, very much stream processing, so it's not about batch processing at all anymore. It's about stream processing, so it's something I had more experience with. It's kind of just another way of looking at it, right? So when you configure it, you'll be able to, you can run it in a standalone mode, so you can, you can run everything in a single Java machine if you want. <coughs> And, and just use the local file for storage. And you can do that for debugging. You know, that might be how you just develop some programs so that, you know, because it's costly to have to submit to a cluster. So for just quick development and debugging, you could do that way. Or you could have what's called this pseudo distributed where they run in different JVMs, but they're still running on the same machine. So you might have a number of different um, JVM processes, right? And, and somehow there's some distribution there, so it's inter-process communication is taking place and you can maybe you can see a bit more of what's happening. What we will run, and I will show you our system is running in a fully distributed manner where you, know, you have all of the components and they're, they're, they're running across a set of nodes. Uh, so just as a summary, you know, this is Hadoop features. It, it you know, stores anything unstructured or semi-structured data. It's all kind of you know, completely open source, written in Java. It, it scales linearly, supposedly. Cost is not exponential. I always question that. But anyway, so the data locality um, you know, and process in the way so you, you, you move. The whole thing is about moving the, the processing to where the data is, not, not having to um, um, transfer data across the network to do the processing. It, it's got all this failure and stuff kind of built in, at least in the storage part of processing. I'm not sure we have to have another look. And it's very cost effective, right? So you can, you can do that kind of thing there. So, so it's, used, it's used for a lot of things. And you know, there's a lot of, of the big companies that, that, that are making use of it. Obviously, if it's 20 to 30% of job postings in this space, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, it's probably the equivalent of, of what used to be the database administrator. Instead of looking for database administrators, maybe people are looking for Hadoop, people with Hadoop you know, skills. I'm not sure. Uh, but, but this is kind of where it's worked. So, so here are some of the references you can uh, have a look and see. We'll just continue now, uh, I think, um, with, with a more detailed uh, understanding now of, of uh, of Hadoop. Um, uh, Hadoop distributed file system. So this will focus very much on uh, on on the file system side of things. Uh, so we kind of we already know it's a distributed file system. It runs on commodity hardware, and uh, you manage a lot of data, and you know supports a lot of analytics. So, so it, it you know it does just to sort of say again, it does want to be able to detect faults and automatic recovery, and a high throughput of data access. So that the, the the focus is on throughput, not on latency. All right. So we did say that there was a trade-off in throughput and latency earlier. So the focus is on, on, on make, making sure everything is as busy as possible 
rather than making sure that you get a response to a calculation as quickly as possible. Right? So that it's all about throughput. Um, so, so, so scale and you know, write once, read many access mo model for files. So typically you're just going to write the data once. You're not, you're not really going to update it, right? So there's some nomenclature to talk about um, that, that we should say. So, so Hadoop calls a, has a rack, which is a collection of nodes that are physically stored close together and are all on the same network. So the, the, the nodes in a rack should be on a, typically they'd be on a high speed, a high speed network of some kind, right? Um, and, and, uh, and so they, they could communicate together quite, quite quickly. They, they, they might be just nodes in the same building, maybe, you know, in, in some, you, could, you, can, you can define rack however you like in some sense. When you tell Hadoop these are nodes on the same rack, you're saying to Hadoop that, you, that Hadoop should assume that these nodes can communicate very fast with each other. Whatever, the, you, whatever that means to you, you know, or how, whatever. So, so you say that is, that's a rack. A cluster is a collection of racks. So, so you know, we, we define a rack as the set of nodes we have in, um, you know, in Melbourne. There's a set of nodes and then there's another rack for the set of nodes in Tasmania somewhere. And, and then over in, in Perth, there's another rack. So we have three racks in our system and they're very geographically dispersed, these three racks, right? So, so Hadoop will assume that between racks, maybe the cost is quite high for communication. So, so a cluster of collection of racks, a name node manages the file system namespace and regulates access to the clients. Uh, so so all, of the, all of the clients you know, really have to work through the name node. You sort of have to contact that to get access to, to the file system. And there's a single name node for a cluster, but later we'll talk, we'll see that you know, for reliability purposes, you know, we don't want a single point of failure, right? So, for reliability purposes, you can have other name nodes as well. So the data node, so the name node, the, the data node, it, it's going to serve read and write requests and perform block creation, deletion, and replication. But all of this comes from instructions from the name node, right? So that's the data node is really the slave in the system. A file is split into one or more blocks, and a set of blocks are stored in the data nodes. This kind of we understand already, I think. And then the Hadoop block file on the underlying file system, right? So, so a block is, is a file on the underlying file system. So, uh, you know, it, 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 the, the data node just stores it as a file on the regular file system. So the data node will run somewhere and it will, it will have a directory where it stores all of these blocks, yeah? It's just going to store them somewhere. Um, so, and the default size is 64 megabytes, right? So uh, all of them will be the same size apart from the last one. So if it doesn't divide up, properly, then, then you get one more block that's a little bit smaller. So this is kind of what it looks like from another point of view. You know, I have a client that needs to contact the name node to get some information. Um, it, 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 the client will, after getting the information, be able to read. It'll know which data nodes it, you know, it can read from. Uh, it, it does that through another thing, though, called a, a, a reader that we can see a little bit later. Um, and, it, and again, the client is the program that you write. Yeah. That is the program that you would write and, and do something to access the system, right? Or writing to the blocks. Um, the, the name node will send block operations to the data nodes. Data nodes can communicate with each other to, to do replication, for example. So to take you know, a, a block and copy it to another node in the system, they can communicate this way. Um, so, so it's kind of the, the name node has also uh, it has all of the data, the metadata. So, so um, what are the names of the files? How many replicas does each you know each each block in each file have? Um, so the, the you know the directory structure is what the name node keeps. The <laughs> mapping of from the file to the to the blocks, but what it doesn't keep, what at least what it doesn't store, is um, where are the blocks? You know, which data nodes have which blocks? It will learn about that, but it doesn't store it. And we'll see what we mean by that. So, uh, so HDF files are broken into blocks. The basic unit of, of reading writing, it's just like, a, so you read the whole thing, right? It may be larger, so you might use 128 megabytes 
even for the block size, right? It's quite large actually, right? But it's good for, for, for large, so you know, one thing is obviously if you have very small files then uh, you know, there's going to be potentially a lot of waste in this, you know, it's, it's really good for large files. You would put all of your data into, into one big file of some kind. So, so you, you know, we, we, we regularly have files of, of, you know, 10 gigabytes, 100 gigabyte files that are just full of tweets. You know, just, just a one tweet per line in the file and, you know, it's just one file. It's just stored in a flat file like that. Um, and it's good for high throughput. So block may have multiple replicas. One block stored as multiple locations. Um, and, and, it, and it gives it a certain amount of fault tolerance. So why is the block so large? Well, it's really just to avoid the cost of the disk seeks. And this is really talking about, you know, I guess the, the old, uh, you know, the hard disk drives. And, you know, we, we want to use commodity hardware for our Hadoop file system. So we, you know, we're typically going to buy hard disk drives rather than, you know, solid state drives. Um, and, and that's sort of where it was born out of. And, and so to avoid the, the cost of the seek time, you know, you, you want to read more data all at once from the, from the, from the drives. So the bigger the block size, the, the, you know, the, the less that, you know, here's some calculations. So suppose the seek time is 10 milliseconds, the transfer rate is 100 megabytes per second. To make the seek time 1% of the transfer time, you need to have block size about 100 megabytes. So, so, so the block size is large to do that. Um, maybe the, the notion, if you had a, a Hadoop system of uh, you know, solid state drives, then maybe the block size and so on, um, you could get away with having a, a, a bit smaller perhaps, um, but probably you'd probably just keep the same, I don't know. So it's large for that reason. Um, here's a diagram that shows file broken up into blocks. Blocks then having three replicas. And, and it says this is on a data node. What's wrong with this diagram? <laughs> Problem is that it's showing the replicas all on the one data node. And they would never be like that. Right? These, these, you know, the replicas would be spread out over multiple data nodes. So this diagram is kind of misleading, actually. You could probably just put a cross on it, something in this diagram. You know, this, is, this would not be that one block would be replicated on a on a single on a single data node like that, right? Um, if these were racks, right? If they were racks, if it said the word rack there, uh, and each square, little square was a data node, then I think I could understand the correctness of the diagram. But when I looked at it, this whole blue thing made me think that the whole thing was a data node. Well, that, that's wrong, right? So anyway, so, so it's kind of trying to illustrate that there's replicas and so on. But we'll see more diagrams later, right? So, so the, the name node keeps track of the rack ID and, that each, each data node belongs to. So it does know where the data nodes, which rack that they're in. And the default replica placement policy is as follows. So this is a little bit confusing. One third of the replicas are on one node two-thirds of the replicas including the above are on one rack and the other third are evenly distributed across the remaining racks. So there's some sort of policy here for distributing the replicas to improve the write performance without compromising the data reliability or the read performance. I think the next, uh, when we, the next, uh, well, it's a little bit further down, but we, there's a diagram that we will get to that will show this a lot more clearly what, what the, how the replicas are taking place, right? So, so you will see very clearly in the slides that come um, later. But it's trying to do the replication to, you know, obviously to um, improve reliability, but also not hinder performance. <coughs> so we want, we kind of a trade-off between reliability and performance. So let's kind of dive into the details a bit more now. Um, you know, the name node, the secondary nodes, and the data nodes, we'll just see a little bit more how they operate. I have to be a little bit... Oh, we're okay for time, so... Um, so the, the name node stores the namespace. It's the directory structure. That's the, 
the, the you know the, the the file names and the blocks that those files have and the metadata right that's it it's going to record every change in the file system metadata in something called an edit log so there's a a separate thing called an edit log that when you make changes the edit log kind of is a sequence of changes that were made to the to the file to the to the namespace so the namespace including the mapping of the blocks to the files and file system properties is stored in a file called a file system image so you know if you were to shut down the system and start it back up again obviously you, you don't want to lose all of your data so you can turn the system off it, it stores all of this stuff um, it's something called a, a file system image and an edit log and they're stored on the local file system so you shut down the system start it back up it has that information at least the name node starts with that information it keeps an image of the namespace and the file black block map in in, it, in its in its in, you know in memory as it's running obviously right so there's a startup as it starts up there's a bit of procedure we we kind of go through you know it's it's when the name node starts up and and I'll I'll shut down the name node we'll start it up and it's, it doesn't really show much, it just sort of shows nodes going off and then on again, we can see later. But, you know, it's going to load the file system image to the edit log from disk. It goes into what's called a, a safe mode. So when it first starts up, it kind of, it knows about the existence of files and that there should be blocks for those files. But, and it knows the data nodes, but it doesn't know which data nodes have which blocks the data nodes later have to report this back to the name node so it goes into a safe mode while it's waiting to collect information from all of the data nodes right that are going to send it all whole of information so so I forgot to ask you know, at the beginning who here has used a dupe file system anybody you, you're all it's the first time that you've 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 used Hadoop who's used Hadoop to do anything at all really so you're all very new to this right okay so so it, it starts it's in there's a bunch of demons so there's a heartbeat monitor that is going to just make sure that the data nodes are alive you know so the data nodes could fail so every regularly a heart, they send what's called a heartbeat it's just a message very regular Say, yes, I'm still alive, yes, I'm still alive, yes, I'm still alive, right? That's what it is. A lease manager is for, you know, when people write, when clients write to files, they first need to get a lock so that other clients maybe don't try to write to the same file at the same time. So there's a lease that is called, you're getting a lock. There's a replication monitor that's going to make sure that the number of replicated blocks is what it should be. So as data nodes go down or fail or whatever, you know, or somebody changes the replication factor, the monitor is eventually going to make sure the right number of copies. And, and decommission manager, I, you know, I, I think that's for when you put uh, data nodes for, uh, completely out. I'm not sure exactly. So the, there's a, a remote procedure call services and there's a HTTP server that, uh, you know, you can, you can go with your web, your web browser and just look at the status of the system and see is it, you know, is it up and running and browse through the file system even. And, and, you know, when people delete files, they go into a trash, like a regular kind of file system or operating system process, and, and eventually the trash needs to be emptied uh, you know, to, to make sure that you don't accumulate, you know, wasted space. So the, the, the name node startup, it loads its file system image, and we'll talk a bit more about this in later slides, but uh, it, there's, there's, a, there's a directory... Um, that you can set or configure, but it has those, the edits and the FS image and the time that it was created and so on, a version. There's, there can be multiple such directories for reliability purposes. We'll talk a bit more about that later, right? So, so but it loads that from, 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 the, from somewhere, from its local directory perhaps. And then it checks the consistency. So if there's multiple copies of this, we have to make sure that they're all the same. And again, we'll talk a bit more about that. So we load these things. Um, and then save the namespace back again and, and, and sort of make sure that everything is, um, is, is, in, the, is in the correct order. So, so we, now we sort of enter this safe mode. Um, so we've got the, the, you know, the name node has got its image um, and locations of blocks aren't known yet. I keep saying that this is what happens. So, so it's going to stay in safe mode 
uh, until it gets this condition. So it'll exit when the minimum replication condition is met. So it, there are some parameters here, but the default is that 99.9% .9 of the blocks have one replica. So it won't leave safe mode until, it's, until the data nodes have reported enough blocks that it knows of so that it can work um, properly. Um, so, so the data nodes will start reporting, and again, we'll talk about that later. Um, so, um, so there's a safe mode monitor that will check this condition and then leave safe mode. Or, you, you know, as an administrator, you can just tell it, leave safe mode. You know, you start it up, I don't want to wait around for you. I just want to start writing files or something like that. And so you can sort of just tell it to go out of safe mode, right? So then it goes and starts all those demons, and I sort of said already, so there's this heartbeat monitor. Um, you know, that, that, that just checks the data nodes and sees what, you know, so, so if a data node stops sending a heartbeat, then, you know, we just assume it's failed, right? If you don't get a heartbeat message anymore, then the data node, we just say, okay, we just kill it. It's gone. Even if it sends later, it starts sending a heartbeat, you know, um, uh, we just, at, at some point, you have to assume that it's died. That's the only thing you can assume. And then, so you need to go through a process of, of you know, replicating those blocks uh, somewhere else. So then there's a lease manager and there, you know, if a client dies while it's writing a file, then that means that there's a lock that is, will be, is stale effectively, right? It needs to be removed, so we need to sort of look at leases and stuff like that. Um, and the replication manager obviously is very important. There's, a, there's an interval where it will check every, it says default at three seconds, it's going to check over if replications have changed. And the decommission manager will check and set no decommission. So if you, I, I guess if you, if you specifically turn off data nodes, then these things need to be shut down, right? So, so these demons, these are all running, uh, you know, as part of the name node. And a trash emptier that's just going to empty the trash every now and then, right? So you sort of, uh, it does, maybe you don't want to empty it. You can turn it off if you, you know, uh, you're not if you're worried about things that, that you maybe you don't want to lose data, right? So there's something that. So the secondary name node, we've talked a bit about. We just sort of mentioned it, but never really said anything about it. It's not a standby or backup node. So it's not something that's going to sort of replace the 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 name node. Um, it's only used for checkpointing. So it, it does have a, a non-real-time copy of the FS image. It needs as much memory as the name node to do the checkpointing. There's a diagram coming up that we can see. But so, so it's, it's just used to do that. Now, here's an interesting thing. So one gigabyte um, of F, FS image for every one million blocks. So if a block is 64 megabytes, how much data is that? 1 million times 64 megabytes is 64 terabytes. Is, am I right? Is that right? So for every 64 terabytes, you kind of need a gigabyte of file system image in order to, you know, so it's quite efficient really in terms of, you know, it's not a lot of memory for, for 64. And if, you, if you, you could increase the block size potentially, um, and the more you increase the block size, obviously, then the, the, the more that you maybe you have less efficiency in terms of the, the, you know, the replication and, you know, the number of blocks and the distribution. The block size is too big, then, you know, you need even bigger files in order to make the block, you know, and so on and so forth, right? So these are trade-offs. So what happens with the secondary name node? So there's this process that, of checkpointing. So the primary name node, it has its... You can't quite read, but it has F, F, its FS image, its file system image, and, and it has an edit log. And, and every now and then, these things are copied by the secondary name node. While this copying is taking place, more edits can, can come into the system. So more changes to the file system you know, could, could be coming. This isn't changing, but just the edit log is changing, right? And, and what the secondary name node is doing is taking these two things and it's merging all of the edits into the file system image to create a new image, right? Which is the image that contains all of the edits, right? And that new image then is transferred back to the primary name node, which becomes then the new uh, current image 
for the primary name node, but there are potentially these new edits that came along um, along at the same time, right? So the secondary name node is really just there to help um, merge the edits into the image in, in a reliable way and create this checkpoint image for us. And you know, a certain thing crashing could happen, and still, you know, you could you can roll back to 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 a, a state where you had a consistent edit and an FS image where you could somehow re recover to, right? So that's really all that the um, secondary name node is there for to, to really, it's, it's just merging the edits into the, into the image to create a, an image, a new image that, you know, with the, with the edits. And they just keep doing this maybe every five minutes it says, or depending on the, on the size of the edit log, if it, if it gets, you know, so it, it, it sort of, um, you check every five minutes if, if, if it's bigger than that or that there might be some some other parameter that, that uses, right? So this is a way of keeping keeping the, the file system image up to date. Um, so that's the name node and the secondary name node. What about the data node? Um, so this is going to store all of the data and it's just going to store it in files on the file system. So it's a process that runs, it receives commands from the name node, you know, store this block, is this block or whatever, and, and it just stores those 64 megabyte blocks onto the local storage, right, right at whatever. And it, it doesn't know about HDFS files, it just knows about blocks. And it just stores them in separate files. Um, it, it might store them in subdirectories or it has some sort of structure, but it's, it's really just every block is in a file and it's really just responsible for, for putting them on, onto, the, onto the file, right? So, so when the data node starts up, it scans through wherever it's storing the files and, and, it, and it generates a list of all the blocks that it, that it has and it, and it sends that to the name node. So that, you know, the name node would start up first and the, the data nodes will start up and as they start up they, they send a call to block report. Here are all the blocks I know about. Here are all the blocks I have. The name node will, will know for this file these are the blocks that it should be there somewhere on some data node, right? So, so when the block report comes from the data node, then the name node can know now which data node has which blocks. Right. And you might think, why is this like this? And you, um, if you think a bit more about um, you know, the things that can fail and, and trying to build a system that you, know, you can just shut down a data node, start up another one, and not have to worry, be very self-healing. This is a, a way of going about it that, that will mean that the process of making sure that everything is working correctly is quite, quite convenient, right? It's quite, quite elegant, actually, to do this way. So, so, so that's essentially what it will do, right? It will start, and then when it's done that, then it will start receiving commands to, to read blocks or write blocks. So coming back to the block placement policy, so, so with a replication equal to three, the first block will be stored on the same node as the client, so that's, um, if the client is actually running on one of the, you know, of the, of the nodes itself, the client might be uh, coming from outside the cluster. You know, it might not be running on the cluster. So, so um, then you might. I think it's, it picks a random, a random, a random node, right? A random rack and random node. Um, and then the, what happens is that. So the, the, the first block or, or the block's first copy of the block gets stored on some data node in some rack, in this case node B. And then it's, it's pipeline, it's called pipeline, across to another rack, another node in another rack. This will be, must be in a different rack. Um, and then it's pipeline, but in this case the third replica is always to a node in the same rack. Uh, so, so, so that, that, that this, so these are these three nodes. In this case, this is the example, um, are the nodes upon which the replica will be. So, putting on a different rack altogether gives us some uh, uh, um, reliability, right? We, we, you know, we've got we've got so you know a whole rack could go down in some sense. So that would be terrible. But then you've got another copy. It's, it's distributed. Putting on the same rack, presumably, these. Uh, this, as we said, actually, you know, the definition of a rack is that um, the the data nodes on a rack have high-speed communication. So this is 
you know, not so high speed communication here, you know, a bit slower, but on inside a rack is high speed. So, so this is more for performance reasons. If you have both the data nodes and you, and you, you know, you need to read those data. Uh, if, if you have to have a lot of processes running that need access to that, then if they run on the same rack, at least they'll have a higher performance um, reading of that data. So there's a kind of trade off so that we're not pushing them onto different racks, all the three replicas but doing a sort of trade-off like this. And it's a pipeline as well, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that when we see. Um, so, from a point of view of the data node writing blocks on the local file system, the data on the local file system, you probably have a number of disk drives, yeah? Um, Maybe in your laptop you've only got one disk drive but the, the machine might have several disk drives but the the uh, uh, Hadoop the data node doesn't do anything special it just puts the blocks onto the first disk and fills it up and then it puts starts filling up the next disk when it's you know the first one is almost full or failed and so it just treats the disks as just a bunch of disks yeah it's very simple in that way right so um, you know, the, the, we're trying to get the performance at a higher level rather than at the, the level of, of, of the... And it's a little bit easier to understand and manage, right? So the data node might go offline, offline when the disks have failed and there's a, there's a parameter you can set and say if so many of the disks on this local machine of this data node have failed, then this data node entirely just stops working. You know, like it, 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 it just says we, we de decommission it perhaps or we need to repair it or something like that, it will stop sending the heartbeats perhaps or it sends a particular command and says it's now failed, right? So you can sort of tolerate perhaps a certain amount of, of disk failure but, but there'll be a limit upon which you say now we don't tolerate anymore, right? So there's nothing really special happening at the data node. When the data node start up, um, it loads the data nodes. We sort of talked a bit about registers itself to the name node. So, you know, I'm a new data node, here's my name, you know, here's who I am. Um, start the it starts the inter-process communication server. There's a, a data transceiver server which is for transferring blocks, so that's a particular um, process for doing that. Um, and then it runs a main loop which is just, you know, scanning over the blocks, sending the heartbeat message regularly. We, we talked about, you know, checking the blocks, sending, processing commands from the name node and, and sending these block reports, you know, as Blocks uh, either die because it maybe a disk has died, so well these blocks are no longer available, you know. So I have a new block report, and maybe then the name node needs to decide, okay, well the, these blocks are no longer there, so I've got to do what? I've got to do replication, right? I have to do something to to recover from that. Um, so 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 it's just going to sit in a loop doing these things, right? So so that's what the data node will do. The transceiver in particular. You know, it accepts connections and, and, um, and there's some parameter on the maximum number or something that it can do, but it handles the reading and the writing and the replacing of blocks, right? So there's a process just for, for getting, you know, from other data nodes or, or from the name node or the client or whatever. So a little bit more specifically, we have write, you know, let's look at writing files, reading files, you know, changing the replication factor and so on, right? So it's a little bit blurry, but and there's really not much example code here, but um, you know, so uh, in, in Java you, you do something like you'd create a, a DFS client and then you, you create an output stream, you know, you create with some parameters there and then you just write to that to write the, you know, write the file effectively um, and then close, and, and, and close the, the client. So you know, there's obviously a lot of details missing, but generally that's kind of, you know, like, a little bit like opening a file locally and just writing the bytes to the file you know, and then closing the file, right? It's a very simple, straightforward operation. But on the uh, Hadoop side, so that that client is creating a distributed um, file system, you know, well, there's a, a library there effectively where you say create the file. The create goes off to the name node. It's got to get a, a lease on that. So that will, the name node will, will we'll talk a bit more about, but it will create a lock on there. And then, um, and so one, two, three, then it can start writing. So it'll also get from the name node, we'll come back where should we write. It writes that through an output stream and it, you know, uh, another 
uh, class effectively. And, and, and now you can see actually a little bit more about this. So, so it's writing the data, let's just say this is for a particular block. And, it, and the write comes here and then one data node just communicates with another data node. So when we want to write three replicas, it's not that we write to one data node and then write to another data node and then write to a third data node sequentially, but the writing is pipelined through the data nodes. So the, 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 the bytes come here and then this data node forwards it onto that data node and says, well, now you put, and now you put. And these two might be on the same rack. Or maybe these two are on the same rack and this one is on, a, is on another rack, right? So, you know, things can be like that. But at least two of these will be on the same rack. But so that what is happening is you're getting some parallelism in the, in the writing of these blocks, of these replicas. So, so that will happen and then the acknowledgements can come back um, through here to say that everything has happened and, the, and then the block is written and then this thing might then say, okay, write another bl block of the file and the file will get progressively written to the to the data nodes in this way, right? So that is, that is how the write takes place. Um, there's a few things that need to happen. You know, you, the file already exists, maybe. Um, maybe you don't have permission to write the file, like a standard file system. You, the, these things have to get checked. You have to get a lease, and, and you might need, obviously, to, to add, you know, to the, to the, da the, the directory structure, there are inodes similar to the you know, Linux file system. You know, uh, so so this is really just sort of saying what I was saying, right? It's 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 um, it's got to get these nodes to write. It's got to break it into packets and and then write those and then to the transceiver and then there's this pipeline, right? When it's done, then it can go and remove its lease. So it's, it's done the right and then it goes. And then while the file is being written, it has a under construction status. You know, it, it's there, but uh, it's still being constructed. Potentially other, other clients can see it. You know, so the, the, the lease is really just for writing. It's like a write lock. But other clients can see, but it's under construction. Until the file is complete, then you should not really be reading from the file, right? So it goes from there to there. So the lease, as I've kind of said a few times now, is a write lock for file. Um, no, there's, there's no lease needed for reading files. It's really just for modifying the files. And it's there, obviously, to avoid concurrent writes on the same file. Otherwise, you have some sort of consistent inconsistency problem. So, so it's, it's managed by the name node, and, 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 and you need it when it's created. Um, or added to, or, or somehow you, you're modifying the lease is added. Sorry. Um, and so, so it has to. Where was I? Um, so here yeah, it has to be managed, obviously, and there's some sort of thing that's going to manage that. I, I don't think there's a lot we need to worry about exactly how that works. It will expire. Um, so if the client were to go away, eventually that lease will just expire and, and, and it can be reclaimed then and other files could start writing, uh, sorry, other clients could start writing. So it will expire, you can make that a larger, you know, um, you know thing and, and, and so on, right? So there's competition for writing files. For reading from files, it's very similar, create a file. You need to open it and then you, then you sort of, you just start, start reading from it, you get the bytes and then you close. And, and it, it, it's a little bit different, though, in this sense that, I mean, you, you, you don't need to create replicas when you're reading. You only need to read from one of the blocks. You don't need to read from one copy of each of the blocks. So, um, so again, you, you know, the client will go through to the name node to get the block locations. It will then go to this uh, class to, to actually do the reads, you know, the different blocks from wherever they happen to be and, and recover all of the data, right? So that's, that's the way that's great. So it just reads block by block, yeah. And it's a checksum, obviously, at the end. Like all file systems, you 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 so still the client doesn't trust. You know, it wants to make sure. So you know, all files will have some sort of checksum, and there's there's something to make sure that everything is okay. Um, so you know, there are other things that you can do, and we'll see um, example of doing this, um, not in the code, but we will do through command line. 
um, where you know you can set the replication factor to to whatever you want for a particular file. You can make it replication factor of two or four or ten or something like that, whatever you like. Um, the smaller the replication, obviously, the less re you know, redundancy um, <laughs> you, you, you have, and 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 um, but the less storage space you're using, but the more than the, have the, the you know the, the more reliable and the more throughput you can get if you need to you know the process to access all that same data the same block then it will be on on many more nodes and so on so we'll see an example of doing that um, when that is done then uh, you know the again the name node is told that there's a change in the replicated you know the replication for this file so that becomes part of the edit log and uh, it then needs to go, it's a bit hard to read, but it then needs to go to the data nodes and sort of give them the commands to say, you know, create more um, blocks or delete blocks. We don't need that block anymore, you know, and so on, right? So it's going to send these commands um, to try to, uh, to all of the data nodes that it knows that have those blocks to, to make the system uh, have the correct number of blocks, right? Uh, so, so this was actually about decreasing, so it's, it's going to be about deleting, right? Um, you know, it's, it's got to uh, pick, pick from some of them. You know, if you go down to two, I, don't, I, I imagine it might pick the one that's on the same rack, so you've still got some on, on different racks, you know, exactly which ones it picks. There might be some parameters to, to, to know how it's going to do that. Obviously, there are different strategies, um, what kind of processing that you're doing that, that might be relevant to exactly which one does it do, do but it invalidates them, um, and they, they become to be deleted block set. And eventually, you know, on the next heartbeat message, then you give the delete block command to the, it goes and deletes, and then, you know, sends back a block report, right? There's block reports constantly coming back to the name node to say this is the way the blocks look on, on this name, on this data node, and all the data nodes keep doing, right? Um, so if the data node stops sending a heartbeat, uh, then, you know, we assume that it's dead. <laughs> That's why it's called a heartbeat. If your heart stops beating, I'm, you know, you're out of luck, <laughs> I think. Right, so, so, you know, that's the assumption and then the name node is going to, you know, heart, it has a heartbeat monitor, so fine when the data node dead when doing the heartbeat check. It will remove all the blocks that belong to the data node and it will update, you know, the, the um, needed replication. So obviously it needs to replicate those blocks again and then the replication monitor needs to go and compute the blocks to be replicated on, on, you know, for each of the data nodes and then again on the next, on the, those other data nodes, for their heartbeat, send them the, you know, the, the replication block command, and and and, rep, and the data node will replicate the block. It will transfer it from, you know, from another copy from somewhere, right? So these replicated blocks aren't coming, being transferred ever back to the name node. They're always the data is being, obviously, being communicated between the data nodes in a kind of peer-to-peer -peer way, right? So they're just communicating directly um, with each other. <coughs> So, um, so that's the, you know, how the data node and the name node and the secondary name node work. This is not my water, is it? This is, uh... So the last part of this, uh, before we get to the demonstration, is um, talking about high availability. So um, the name node uh, is a single point of failure. You know, we, we, that's what we call it. If the name node were to die, uh, we can't access the system anymore, right? Which is bad. And, uh, um, you know, because it, presumably any of the nodes in the cluster could die. <laughs> no node is really any, we don't want to, you know, so one solution is that for the name node, you put it on a very expensive computer <laughs> that, that has high reliability and, you know, and, 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 and maybe won't die very easily. <laughs> right, that's one. But we don't want to do that. This is all about using commodity computers. So, you know, we want to be able to have a system still that we can run reliably, you know, uh, without, without, to, to, without expense, right? So, 
but this is a single point of failure. So it holds all the metadata. The whole cluster becomes un unavailable. Now the, the, the file system image you can recover from the secondary name node. It's not up to date. So you might sort of fall back a bit depending on how many edits have been done. And you know what was the polling time? How often did you do the checkpointing? So, um, so, so that's not really great for that purpose, right? Um, so we need some other solutions. We need some high availability solutions too. So what what can we do? There's a few possibilities. One is to use a sort of distributed replicated block device. So I, I, I uh, it's a particular word, I, 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 you know, block device. I think it's a particular technology. Um, you can have a look here and see. But what it's going to do is, if you remember, we said that the name node has a directory where it stores the file system image and the, and the uh, what else? The edit log and the file system timestamp. It stores those things in there. And when it starts up, it reads from that directory. And at that point, I said, oh, and there could be many such directories. Uh, and and when, it, when it starts up, it needs to sort of make sure that they're all the same. It will read from one of them. I said, there could be many. And it's kind of like RAID 1. It's going to have a kind of mirror of the directory structure. Um, and and, and, uh, and it's... Um, so, so they're kind of like backups or call backup for the name node. Um, so if, for example, the, the, the disk that the name node was storing its file system, the whole computer went down potentially, the whole machine crashed, right, so it's dead. You can start the name node up and still get a copy from, one of the, from somewhere else, right, so um, from, from somewhere else. So it's keeping copies of these things. That you, you might need to transfer it, it depends. It might take some time, um, but it's, it's keeping a copy, right? So, so mirror one of the name nodes to, to a remote node. So you can store, the name node might store um, this name directory on, on other nodes, maybe some of the data nodes in the system or somewhere, right? So it's keeping copies on other machines. They're all the same, they're copies. So when it fails, you know, if copy the mirrored name dir to all the name dirs and restart the name node. And, and it could take a little bit of time. It's not perfect but it's it's one you know it's, it, it recovers from a certain kind of failure where that the 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 directory might 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 fail in some way right so this is kind of one thing um, and then um, there's this notion of an avatar node so I think that's pretty clear having different copies of, direct, of the directory structure at least you want to make sure that you don't lose that information. But then there's something called an avatar node. So this is a complete what we call hot standby. So a hot standby is something that, that, can, that can start working immediately This something else fails. So in a disk drive system sometimes you talk about a hot spare and a hot spare is a disk that's not being used but is on and is ready. If one of the disks fails, the, the hot spare can immediately start repairing or you, know, you don't have to wait, right? So it's sitting there. It's expensive to have such a thing sitting there just waiting for failure to happen. But you know, that if you want high reliability and high availability, you know, that's the kind of thing that you need more. It's the availability that we're getting at, that the system is up and running you know, as, for a, as great a fraction of time as possible. So the way that the avatar works is that we have a, a network file system, which is just a, a, a standard, you know, shared file system across a number of nodes. It, it's, you know, like this was originally, I guess it's Sun's, or now Oracle, since Oracle bought Sun, but you know, Sun's NFS. It's just something simple for sharing data across a bunch of nodes, and it, it stores actually the FS image and the edit logs, right? So it's on a, a network file system. The standby node consumes all of the transactions from the edit logs on the NFS continuously. So everything that gets written into the edit logs, the, the standby node, which is another, you know, it's, it's just another name node that's doing the same thing as the name node, it gets it, it, continuously, and all the data nodes will send messages to both the primary and the standby node. So if the primary name node were to die, 
we could just switch over immediately to the other, to the standby node. And that can, that can be quite quick. It's kind of less than a minute to do that. So here's a diagram that shows the, the shared directory um, on, the, on the NFS, right? So this is where the, where the file system image and that sort of stuff and the edit logs will be stored. And the, and the active name node and the standby name node, all the, the, the data nodes uh, are, uh, you know, sending their block reports to both now, not just one, but both, so that these two things can really, they should be identical in what they contain in the memory. Yeah, they're, they're all doing, they're just doing the same things, right? So, and they're coordinated via Zookeeper. So, so uh, Zookeeper, we kind of didn't talk about, but it's a, uh, uh, it's a resource management system that um, it has some, some reliability there that, that client nodes can contact and get some information about what is running, what processes are running. So, so if one of the processes were to die, we sort of use Zookeeper to, to, to know that that's happened. Um, so, so that's kind of what's happening, right? The active name node is writing the transaction log to the NFS, and this is reading and consuming the, it's just the transaction log, just the edit log, right? So it's just as the edits come, reading from that and processing the other things. Because as you remember, the, the clients connect to the name node to do, say, to get a lease or to, to find out information to make changes. And you don't want the clients to have to connect to both of them. So the clients will just connect to one of them and that thing will write the edit log here and this will read the edit log, right? So that's the way that it's doing, right? So, um, so, so it kind of works like that. Um, so when there's a failover, then, then there'll be some entry in Zookeeper that will be destroyed and then all the clients will know the failover is in progress. That we, the clients will sort of then know that they need to go to the, uh, to the standby node, to the other node, right? You stop the primary node. Um, the last bits of data are flushed to a transaction log or whatever through, through that. You know, it's, it's, it's dead somehow. And then switch over to switch, switch the standby now becomes effectively the primary. Um, so, and then change, change Zookeeper, right? So, um, to, to reflect that. So I think there's a diagram. So, you know, there's a standby, there's a primary, there's all the data nodes, there's Zookeeper, and, 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 and the Zookeeper is just, you know, the clients are using Zookeeper to, to know, you know, who should they talk to? Should they be talking to this one or this one down here? <clears throat> so, so and, and that's 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 kind of what the situation. The last thing is a um, a backup node for the high availability. Um, so this is, I guess, a bit a bit simpler. But the the uh, the name node will will synchronously stream the transaction log to the backup node. So every transaction that comes through here. Well, the edit log, I guess it's the same thing, um, will we'll come over to the, to the backup node. And, and this, this um, the backup node applies log you know, to its in-memory and disk image as well. It's, it's, you know, and then it commits to the disk. And before, so before it's saved, it's not until it's committed to disk and it's, it's kind of become reliable does it send back a success. Um, and so the, the backup node, again, can be something that, you know, you can change over to, right? So this is a bit different way of, of, of doing things. So this is different solutions for, for creating high availability to try to get rid of the fact that this name node is a, a single point of failure. Uh, could, could, could.